Hi, Richard Sortome here again with another video. The last video I posted explored my piano concerto, which received its world premiere in February of 2020 with the marvelous American pianist Pamela Mia Paul and the North Texas Wind Symphony conducted by Daniel Cook. In that video, I focused on my using only three notes, a B flat, an A natural, and a G sharp to create thematic material and the incredible importance of being able to develop that material, no matter how short, into musical ideas. In this video, I will shine the light again on the piano concerto, but will focus on the three themes contained therein. In writing this work, although I did not have a specific piano concerto targeted for inspiration, my goal from the very beginning was to have it be a successor of sorts to the great contemporary romantic piano concerti. I wanted a grand romantic theme, a sensitive reflective theme, a slower yet very passionate theme, a cadenza filled with daring colors and moods, and short interludes of intimate improvisational and exciting music. This work even with its clearly delineated architecture, is very free form, and that manifests itself in the three themes and the three interludes I'm about to discuss. Theme one is broad, long, and big. Themes two and three of totally different character and nature from theme one are shorter, but they do qualify as themes. The three interludes I will leave to discuss a little later on in this video. I will show you early sketches in my hand scores before showing you the final Sibelius piano score and play all the themes in my music software Logic before playing all of them in videos from the live world premiere. Theme one is definitely the grandest. I spent five weeks studying many, many piano concerti before I wrote even a single note of music and out of that study, the influence of Rachmaninoff is most clearly heard and felt in theme one. If I were to choose an adjective, bold might be one that was appropriate, as is rhapsodic. But I also did not want it to be busy because there was plenty of that in the solo piano's unaccompanied introduction cadenza. Instead, I searched for a broad melody that was eminently singable. If we go over here and look at an early sketch in my hand score, I think you can see, even though it's kind of messy, that I was searching for this theme. I renumbered bars. I moved a bar up to some place where it was not originally there. There's plenty of erasures and, of course, color coding. But in addition to the musical process of finding this theme, there was another component involved very complex and very time-consuming. Ravel described this other component brilliantly while writing about his own piano concerto in 1931. Quote, composing is 75% an intellectual process, unquote. Now, if we look at the Sibelius final piano score, you can see a lot of what I call musical open space. Now, it's not just the open space between the written notes, but it's audible open space. And by audible open space, I mean the amount of time it takes for a chord to decay before the next chord sounds. The first chord is four beats. D, D. Now, this was by design in my writing from the beginning to help create grandness. So here I'm going to play it for you in logic. I'm going to play the video of that theme from the live premiere in just a second, but before I do, I want to ask you to pay attention while the video plays, 
not just to the solo piano, but to the orchestration as well, which is quite large. I mentioned that I didn't want this theme to be busy, which it is not, but there is plenty of activity and complexity in the orchestration to help keep driving this broad melody forward rhythmically. Here's the video of the premiere. Now, what you just heard was a fragment of theme one lasting about 12 seconds. In reality, the theme lasts a little over two minutes. Now, with a theme of that length, there has to be variation to its musical ideas. It's a must. It's absolutely necessary. And to that end, I employed using modulations and rhythmically complex phrases, often displacing the strong beat. Now, you can hear the entire theme one, you can see it by going to my website and click on the link to the video. Just scroll it up to about two minutes and 13 seconds and let it play for two minutes. At that point, the solo first trumpet takes over the melody and the piano accompanies, running all over the keyboard, playing virtuosic filigree passage work. Let me say here that separate from the themes, and up to this point, you've only heard theme one. There are many sections of connected musical material, the interludes I referred to in my opening remarks. As melodic or exciting as they might be, however, they don't qualify as themes. They are part of my freeform style, contributing short moments of reflection, sensitivity, or excitement to the overall concerto. Sometimes they lead into a theme, or sometimes they just stand on their own. Let's take a look at the Sibelius piano score now. At 118, this interlude starts. It's marked on Dante Espressivo. It only lasts about 10 or 11 bars, and it's a gentle interlude, but it doesn't qualify as a theme. Here I'll play it for you in logic. play this interlude, the video of the live world premiere performance with Pamela. Second, let's go back to the Sibelius piano score again. And at 128 is this second interlude marked Poco Andante. It's of similar tempo, it's very gentle, it's marked Dolce. It is loosely based on those three notes that I discussed in the first video, B flat, A natural, and G sharp, except here it's an F natural, an E natural, and an E flat. Of note here, is that these two interludes occur within 30 seconds of one another. Traditional themes could never be that close together nor that short. Here it is in logic. And here's the video of play, uh, Pamela playing into the live world premiere. Third, if we go back to the Sibelius piano score, 
At measure 328 is the third interlude I want to discuss. It's of completely different character than the first two we talked about. First of all, it's marked sempre forte, pesante, and meno allegro. It's not super fast, but it's fast, and it's all 16th notes. This is a short section generating a lot of excitement at this point, but it's still not a theme. Here it is in logic. <laughs> Before I play the video of this interlude for you, I just want to alert you to something in the orchestration. There are four growling saxophones that I wrote in. They don't have particularly complicated parts. They have three quarter notes and two eighth notes per bar, but I wrote growl over each note and it contributes and makes a very funky character. Here's the video. Okay, let's take a look at theme two now. If you come over here and look at this early sketch from my hand score, you'll see that I even wrote theme two up at the top of the page. Now, that's obvious, I get it, but it is important, it was important for me. I wanted to remind myself, keep reminding myself, as I search for this theme, that it had to be of a totally different character and nature from theme one, and it is. It's not based on those three notes nor any earlier material. It's an entirely new and longer melody, thus qualifying it as a theme. Of note here is that the melody is not always heard in the top voice. I freely passed it around in between the voices of the right and left hand of the piano. Now, I'm gonna play it for you in logic, but before I do it, I want you to look at the Sibelius piano score. As it plays in logic, I'm going to guide you through these eight bars, showing you how the melody floats between different voices, which are highlighted in orange. Here's logic. Top voice. Middle voice. Top voice. Left hand, top voice. Right hand, middle voice. Top voice. Okay, and here's the video from the live world premiere. Now I want to discuss theme three. I know a little earlier, while I was discussing the interludes, I stated that interlude one and interlude two happen within 30 seconds of one another, and that traditional themes are usually not that close and never that short. Well, theme three comes right on top of theme two when it ends. The only reason this works is that theme two is a traditional an authentic theme lasting over a minute and a half. Now, if we go back to the Sibelius piano score here, let's go and look at theme two again. It's piano, it's a gentle, gentle melody. It goes along, it goes along, and it does build up, it gets to forte at one point where the notes become longer, and then there's a big retard and it gets softer and softer, and it comes to rest on a triple piano, super soft, double octave, an E-flat and a B-flat, held with a fermata, with then a breath and bang, theme three comes crashing in. 
This is the slower but very passionate theme I talked about in my opening remarks. This is an entirely new melody, not based on any previously played material. It's not derivative of anything, which is why it qualifies as a theme. It has a one bar bold statement and then calms down for one bar. And then it immediately repeats those dynamics in a two bar utterance. And it also has more open voicings, as you can see, that are similar to theme one. Now I'm only gonna play four bars of this because I want you to get to hear Pamela, who is very special with this theme. Now, wait till you hear Pamela. Wow. Of note here is the freedom of expression demonstrated by Pamela. I'm sure you all heard the different tempi that she played from what I had programmed into Logic. Some measures were faster, some retards were slower. But that's fine with me. That's perfectly okay. Of course, I did have specific tempi and dynamics in mind when I wrote this theme. But with an artist of Pamela's talent and abilities, I wanted to hear what she brought to this section, what her interpretation was. And her interpretation of this theme showed how wonderful her musical ideas are in regards to tempi and dynamics. I'd like to close this video out by talking about the one tutti that occurs in the concerto at about halfway through lasting three minutes. I took elements from the solo piano's unaccompanied introduction cadenza and orchestrated them for various sections of the wind symphony, taking some liberties with note durations and tessitura. In this tutti, I also took the second theme and orchestrated it for saxophone quartet, bassoons, contrabassoon, bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet, two trombones, euphonium, and tuba. Now the concept for orchestrating theme two featuring a saxophone quartet presented itself to me very early on in the process, and for good reason. A classical saxophone quartet has a beauty, a mysterious tone to it, and with its use of light vibrato, it sets itself apart from any other section of the wind symphony. To give you a little context, I'm going to go back to the video of Theme 2 with Pamela and the Wind Symphony, of course, which at this point is accompanying her with flutes, oboes, English horn, and euphonium. <laughs> Now let's go to the full concert score of this section of the tutti. You can clearly see all the instruments that I orchestrated for. The saxophone quartet, of course, soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, bassoons, contrabassoon, bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet, two trombones, euphonium, and tuba. Now, as you watch the video of the second theme as I wrote it in this tutti, orchestrated for saxophone, quartet, etc., please note 
that the moving melodies are almost all in the saxophone quartet. So that's it for today. With these two videos, I feel I have covered all the elements in the composing of my piano concerto from the incredible importance of being able to develop any thematic material, no matter how short, into musical ideas and to composing different yet identifiable themes. I hope all of you will go to my website, richardsortome.com and watch the video of the complete live world premiere performance. But before I sign off, however, I would like to talk to you a little bit about my next video, which is coming soon. I'm very excited about the subject matter. In it, I will discuss composing music for a concert stage production with actors and projected images as compared to composing music for a film. Most importantly, the music composed for a concert stage production is designed from the beginning, the inception, to stand completely on its own for future performances of the music only if there's to be no budget for a full stage production. As an example, I will use the production which was adapted from the Aesop fable, The Tortoise and the Hare, for which I composed the music. For this production, I compose my music first to just the written story, just the words. Then I made a synthetic realization of the music and played it for the person who adapted the story. We both agreed it was really good. Actually, we thought it was perfect. So at that point, I played the synthetic realization. I actually gave it to the director and the creator of, this, of the projected images, and then, only then, did they create their magic to the music. In composing a film score, the music always comes last. It's written to the final edited version of the film as compared to the music always coming first in a concert stage production, the actions being created to the music after it's written. I think this will be a fascinating video for all of you to see. In it, I will take sections, many sections from this production and play only the music, then play videos of those sections from the actual concert where you will see the actors, the projected images, and live musicians with a conductor playing my music. I've really enjoyed delving into my piano concerto in these past two videos with you. Please feel free to write me an email with any questions or observations you might have, as I always enjoy engaging in conversations about music, any music, not necessarily mine. Just go to the contact tab on my website and start writing. Once again, I've really enjoyed spending this time with you and have a great day.